Before starting, I want to thank everyone, and especially the organizers of this conference, for putting this together and viewers for joining us. Unfortunately, we cannot meet in the Netherlands, but it's incredible that so many individuals registered for this event. Today, I would like to talk to you about two experimental archaeology studies that I completed utilizing ceramic making technology that was used in early Bronze Age Anatolia. Using this data, I will go into further detail about geometric morphometrics and what the generated data from this experimental archaeological study tells us about potting technologies in the early Bronze Age, as well as the transition from one technology to the other. When you think of Molde pottery, you probably think of the famous bevel rim bowls from Aslan Tepe in modern-day southeastern Turkey, or Sami ware that was created during the Roman period. Sami ware, in particular, has been popularized recently by Graham Taylor's ceramic making course. Today, I will instead discuss evidence of the pottery mold that was found in an archaeological site in northwestern Anatolia that dates to the early Bronze Age, so approximately 3000-2000 BCE. The earliest types of pottery are handmade ones. The phrase hand-building traditions is a category of techniques including coiling, slab conduction, pinching, and percussion. This category also includes the mold-made technique, which is discussed widely through this paper. In ceramics literature, manufacturing types are often identified as handmade or wheel-made, since it can be difficult to further break down handmade techniques when it comes down to pinching versus molding. Unfortunately, production technologies in Anatolia have not been investigated intensively, and much more research needs to be conducted. According to Turtecki, handmade ceramics have been prevalent before the emergence of the potter's wheel in early Bronze Age III. While the majority of Anatolia does not provide concrete evidence for ceramic production, the site of Santa Maria does. Due to Santa Maria's unique preservation, archaeologists can almost reconstruct the entire production sequence. During the early Bronze Age, molds begin to be utilized at the site. However, not much research has examined potting techniques before the arrival of this tool. It can be assumed that another hand technique was most likely used. Molds were uncovered at Santa Maria in various contexts, most notably the Pottery Workshop Complex in Rojas's East, which, can, which was a dedicated workspace. This room, in particular, presents direct evidence of processing clay as well as the presence of craft specialist tools. These tools include mortar and pestles, which could be used for crushing, pounding, and rolling added tempers and clay mixtures. Additionally, the mystery of Compla shows evidence of an elite pottery workshop. In Pitbun, on room 56, Concentration of molds were discovered. This room may hint to control over craft production. While much research has not been conducted on handmade ceramics in Anatolia for now, it can be assumed that these techniques were prevalent before the arrival of the potter's wheel. By examining the material evidence and experimental archaeology, I've been able to reconstruct part of the Shanae Napatois sequence. I will now briefly discuss the step by step procedure that was utilized in both the experiments and I will discuss later in this paper. First, the potter would have flattened the piece of clay with her hands and then pressed the clay over the semi-spherical hump mold that was positioned on a flat surface down. By using gravity and a downward pressing motion, the clay would take the shape of the mold. Next, the potter would trim the excess clay off the mold using a blade and then either use a tool or wet fingers to smooth the clay. As the clay dried, it contracted against the mold and took its final form. Finally, the mold of ceramic would have been removed from the mold using a tool. During my experiments, I toyed with letting the ceramic dry until it was the hard and removing it when it was still wet. Both methods were found to be successful as long as the mold was on the bottom when it was being removed. An optional foot ring, which was formed using a coil clay or a slab strip, provided excellent stability and elevated the design. If the foot ring was not applied, then the molded clay could be flattened by dropping it on a flat surface, pressing it with a paddle or initially using a mold that was flatter on the top rather than spherical. During my experiments, the ceramics were dropped on a flat surface except for when the two molds were combined, and the two molds were utilized, one spherical and one semi-conical in shape. At different times during the Bronze Age and the Eastern Mediterranean, the potter's wheel was introduced and became the predominant technology for first shaping ceramics and eventually entirely forming pots especially since Ruben Corbita's crucial 1989 publication on the potter's wheel, archaeologists have focused on the emergence of this equipment and the necessary learned motor skills through experimental archaeology, x-radiography, and the identification of surface features. Although, with time, the potter's wheel was the prevailing ceramic making technology, archaeological evidence across this region has demonstrated that it slowly fused in the craft production 
and potters continue to use older technology, such as coiling, at the inception of its introduction. Unlike today's technology and products, it is difficult to pinpoint the exact origin and state the precise reason why an invention emerged in the past. Rather, we can only hypothesize and test these hypotheses why the de- with the data that is available to us. In 1959, Foster set out to explain these ideas and inventions from an anthropological outlook by using the example of the potter's wheel. In this early publication, he suggests that this new technology may have emerged due to the reduction in time that it required to produce a pot. Additionally, he states that this equipment would have allowed potters to create standardized, mass-produced ceramics in comparison to the previous ceramic-making technology. Here. Foster was merely speaking from a functionalist point of view and was not considering social or external reasons for the invention and the spread of this technology. During my experiments, which I will discuss further, I tested this well-published notion. Since Foster's 1959 publication, archaeologists have utilized experimental archaeology and technology like x-radiography coupled with new data sets to understand why and how the potter's wheel emerged across the eastern Mediterranean during the Bronze Age. Perhaps most influentially, Rue's 2013 article explores technological change through the examination of the emergence of the potter's wheel in the southern Levant. According to Rue, in the beginning of the second millennium BCE, wheel coiling methods were prevalent amongst potters. Soon, the potter's wheel began to infuse into the Shenana Patois sequence, and the archaeological record witnesses the spread of the potter's wheel, most notably during the Middle Bronze Age. Along with the emergence of this new technology, overall changes in society can be noted. Specifically, she states that in the southern Levant, there was the development of large villages, long-distance exchange networks, evidence of territoriality, specialized burial areas, and ritual places. Some have suggested that all of these changes can be attributed to the emergence of chiefdom society or the elite class. In contrast, some scholars, such as Gilead, disagree and believe that these societies remain egalitarian. Whether or not these elites caused the development and the adoption of the potter's will, Without a doubt, some sort of changes was occurring in these societies. To test Foster and following scholars' ideas regarding the potter's wheel and hand-built techniques, I constructed an experimental archaeological study that set out to examine the speed and morphological traits of both the wheel made and mold made ceramics. In January 2019, I traveled to the small town of Kinnik in the city of Bilijik, Turkey, to work with a highly experienced potter named Osman Mantish. I came here to experiment with both the pottery mold and the potter's wheel to address the capabilities and shortcomings of both of these technologies. Osman Mantish, also known as Osman Usta, is owner of Tar Ceramic and has been producing ceramics for well over 40 years. He is particularly skilled and is regularly commissioned to make volcanic ceramics as well as artifact copies for museums. He often holds classes for archaeology and art history students at the surrounding university. Due to his vast experience in ceramic making, I chose to work with him. During my stay with Osman Usta, a total of 16 early Bronze Age ceramics were produced. However, two of the vessels were removed from the sample assemblage because their shape was drastically different from the remaining 14. The middle-made ceramics were crafted in seven different sizes. Diameters with 5.1 cm, 6.2 cm, 8.2 cm, 11.8 cm, 12.5 cm, 10.8 cm, and 12.8 cm based off in situ molds found at the site of Samra Hayek in Kataya, Turkey. The style of ceramics were based off ceramics typically found in western Anatolia. Some of these vessels served as cups or bowls. While archaeologists have uncovered stone and clay molds at the site, only clay molds were used for the study due to convenience. Once all the molds were made and hardened, they were utilized to produce five bowls in each of the sizes that I just mentioned. Spatted vessels were also created using a double mold, but I will not discuss this today. The well-made ceramics were also made in six different sizes in order to mimic the mold-made ceramics. A total of eight mold-made ceramics and six well-made ceramics were made. You may have noticed that there were two additional mold-made ceramics, and this is because the double mold was also tested. However, we did not try to conjoin two well-made ceramics. Following my experiment, I wanted to assess the ceramic standardization that both the pottery mold and the potter's wheel produce. To do so, a morphometric pilot study was conducted. Hussein measured and photographed all the ceramics since I could not access the material laws in America. Once all the ceramics were uploaded to my laptop, they were transferred to Microsoft PowerPoint. Here, a grid system was placed on top of each image. The standardized grid system comprised of six horizontal lines and one centrally located line that was directly through the center of the pod. 
The horizontal lines were placed approximately one centimeter apart, while the central line was situated in an equal position between the farthest points of the horizontal lines. All lines were grouped so that the same grid system could be applied to all the images in the standardized method. Third, the grid system was placed on the top of all the photos and fitted accordingly. Since the ceramics varied in sizes, the grid system had to be adjusted so that the first horizontal line met the mouth, rim, top of the bot, and the last horizontal line met the base, bottom of the ceramic. The grid system was also adjusted so that the central line lay in the approximate middle of the ceramic. Fourth, the grid system and the image of the ceramic were grouped and saved as a separate JPEG file. Now the photos are ready to be analyzed using geometric morphometrics. Morphometrics is the quantitative description, analysis, and interpretation of shape and shape variation. To compare the shape of structures, we must be systematic, and that is where morphometric comes in. Through the creation of Cartesian landmark coordinates, a geometric state can be statistically analyzed. While morphometrics roots are in biology, it has been widely applied throughout the fields of engineering and physical anthropology. With the application of morphometrics, we can analyze whole artifact shapes in a standardized and systematic way. With an understanding of morphometrics, we can now analyze the shapes of pots and speak to several topics such as craft production and transmission of knowledge. To examine samples using geometric morphometrics, various open source programs can be used such as Philonimbus, ImageA with the plugin, Point Blocker, and Viewbox. For this research, Philonimbus was utilized. Using this program, all images were uploaded to a new program, and 2D landmarks were collected. 12 landmarks were collected on each pot, precisely 3 on the top horizontal line, 2 on the middle, 4 horizontal lines, and 1 on the bottom horizontal line. For the top line, the 3 landmarks were collected on the 2 farmost points on the rim, in the midsection. The middle horizontal lines contain points on the two farmost points, and the bottom horizontal line contains only one point collected in the direct center. These points were collected in such a way to capture the full outline of the shape of the pot. Once all the landmarks were collected, a CSV con file containing all the points was downloaded. This process was done three different times. The mold made ceramics, the wheel made ceramics, and the combined data set. Next. Each CSV file containing the landmarks was uploaded to MorphoJ, an open source program used for geometric morphometric studies. Once a new project was started, the CSV file was open. The first function I performed was a generalized progressives analysis, or GPA. This analysis was executed to remove any existing variation between landmark configurations by the isometric scale. All configurations are thus reduced to unit centroid size. Shape differences can be interpreted from the remaining variation existing between the homologous landmark positions. Primarily, this function centers the points, removes the difference in size, and rotates the landmarks until they fit together. This function is necessary when comparing samples of various sizes, and in this case, pods of different diameters and heights. Subsequent, the data was subjected to Principal Components Analysis, or PCA. Significant shape variation existing between the ceramic samples can be examined through PCA. Here, Principal Component 1 describes a major axis of shape variation, and Principal Component 2 represents the second most major axis of shape variation. As further Principal Components are described, they become less critical and informative. PCA was executed to exploit the shape differences between the wheel made and mold made ceramics in Morpho space. Next, using MorphoJ, a discriminant function analysis, or DA, was performed to discriminate the pieing technology based on morphometric traits of the pots. Examine how significantly different the two types of pots are morphologically and to determine if the pieing technology can be detected. When a DA is completed, it is used to approximate the linear combination of characteristics that best separate and identify the groups. Also, a DA was used to show how significantly different the modes of technology are. The final analysis was to see all the pots in morphospace space visually. To do so, a wireframe was first established. To create a wireframe, landmarks be connected in an intuitive way to create an outline shape of the object. Essentially, a line is drawn around the outside of the ceramic. Once a wireframe is established, the ceramics can be viewed in morpho space. This is done by changing the type of graph to transformation grid. By applying the ceramics on this type of graph, you can see the curves of the ceramics more easily.
I just threw a lot of analyses at you, so now I'll break down what all these numbers and charts mean and tell us about ceramics. Overall, there is quite a bit of variation amongst and within the two datasets. Due to the high variation or lack of standardization, I was unable to place the confidence ellipses around the data, and instead, the ellipses surrounded all the plot of data. While there is a lot of variation, you can still identify true clusters, which I noted here in green. A true cluster is a group made with the same dimensions. There are also some false clusters, indicated in red, which are a group but aren't actually made with the same dimensions. While there is a variation, the p-value less than 1, which means that it's overall statistically insignificant. However, when you compare the p-value of the wheel made and the mold made, the p-value of the mold made is almost 50% higher. When you take a closer look at the p-scores and eigenvalues that I showed you earlier, you can see that pc1 and pc2 are accounting for the majority of variation. Interestingly, pc2 is 50% more significant for the wheel made ceramics than the mold made ceramics. The significant difference between the ceramics is the height and slenderness. When discriminant analysis was executed, there was no overlap with ceramics, and you could actually see that the two potting technologies are quite different. However, the computer could not discern all the ceramics. There are a few problematic ceramics that are throwing off the analysis. All in all, the significant difference between the two modes of technology is that the pottery mold creates a shorter and wider pot, while the pottery wheel is creating a taller and slender pot. While this data sounds very promising, there are, of course, limitations. One fundamental limitation of the study is the number of ceramics that were analyzed. A total of 14 ceramics were studied. Of those ceramics, 8 were made using the pottery mold and 6 using the potter's wheel. To generate more accurate data, more ceramics should be crafted and included in this data set. A second deficiency is that this study contains, and many other morphometric studies also have, is that three-dimensional objects were analyzed from two-dimensional representations. Since I left Turkey abruptly in March, the samples cannot be digitized. A third limitation is the number of 2D landmarks that were recorded. The study was limited to 12 landmarks on each ceramic to examine the shape variation. To better understand the variation between the two modes of technology, additional landmarks should be recorded, particularly around the ceramic spaces. Now, let's bring all this information back to discussing the potter's wheel, potting technology, and craft production. This study compared the morphometric variability of two potting technology types, the pottery mold and the potter's wheel. These two modes of production were both utilized during the early Bronze Age III in Western Anatolia and other parts of the now modern state of Turkey. First, let's discuss the morphological variability between the two modes of production. The study found that both methods create variability. However, the mold-made ceramics variability is significantly higher. I'll suggest that the mold-made ceramics variability is primarily caused when the ceramic is removed from the mold and additionally when the outside is being smooth. The variability between the wheel-made ceramics, as stated, is significantly less. The small variability that exists is most likely due to morphological traits caused by forming a pot with two hands and less likely to be from attempting to copy a ceramic with specific dimensions. Now, let's talk about the transition from hand-built techniques to the potter's wheel in Western Anatolia. While the potter's wheel appeared much earlier in Mesopotamia, the potter's wheel does not appear in Anatolia until early Bronze Age III. Through the Great Caravan Route that connected Syria and Mesopotamia to the Aegean, the potter's wheel is distributed through, the, through Anatolia. However, according to Kudu, wheel-made pottery appears during the early Bronze Age 5C phase at Sivanomarmaic, which puts it in the running for the earliest evidence in Western Anatolia. Unfortunately, excavations at the site have yet to demonstrate any evidence of the potter's wheel other than the physical ceramics, which makes me skeptical. During the early Bronze Age III, the period is characterized by its popular wheel-made bowls, platters, tankards, depots, and amphoras. There are also Syrian bottles, but these are imported and not locally made in Anatolia, like the other characteristic pottery. While the emergence of the potter's wheel becomes a characteristic trait of the early Bronze Age III phase, some sites continue to use older methods, namely Sidmarhaic. The archaeological evidence shows that potters continue to use handmade techniques throughout the entire period. According to Kudu, the percentage of handmade ceramics remains constant, while the wheel-made ceramics decrease over time. This claim is shocking because research throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and Mesopotamia has shown that the potter's wheel slowly diffused into craft production and hand techniques becomes less prominent. Thus, Santa Maria poses an issue. According to Kudu, the increase in mold-made ceramics is caused by two reasons. First, the residents of Samarhoyak wanted to create and embrace their own identity. Second, 
The skill of potters disappeared in a matter of one generation. For me, it is illogical to say that mold-made ceramics are a way of forming an identity, mainly when the ceramics are generally uniform in shape and size and glaze. Additionally, it is hard to believe that the skill of potters just disappeared and the craft was lost after one generation. While I have not been able to further examine the ceramics at Cedar Mohair since 2015, I will suggest that perhaps there was an increased demand for more uniform ceramics, like the bevel and bowls, and less skilled laborers came in to make the ceramics. Well made ceramics are relatively simple, and the learning period is drastically shorter than the apprenticeship period for the potter's wheel. Regarding other areas switching from hand techniques to the potter's wheel, Many scholars before me, who are now present at this conference, have shown that the potter's wheel is faster and is in fact more standardized. Additionally, the potter's wheel allows for a wider variety of ceramics to be made, whereas the pottery mold is quite limited. Through this experiment and another one I previously performed, I can confirm that wheel-made ceramics are in fact more standardized as well as factors to produce. The pottery mold is significantly more time-consuming due to the ceramics time to dry before it can be removed from the mold. In the future, I hope to expand my research greatly. As I mentioned in my limitations, my sample size was only 14 ceramics, so I hope to add more ceramics to my study. In terms of potters, I would like to expand my data set to include other professional potters. For my morphometric study, I would like to increase my number of landmarks, especially to capture the pot shape. Visually, there seems to be quite a bit of variation on the bottom as well. I would also like to 3D scan the ceramics so I can analyze them with 3D landmarks as well as compare this data to 2D landmarks. Finally, I plan to make more molds and study both the amount of shrinking when fired and the use wear. Unfortunately, I began using my molds for public outreach purposes and their integrity severely decreased. Many of them even broke apart since they soaked up so much water. Thank you, Tishikido Danning. I would first like to thank everyone for staying through my presentation full of charts and numbers. I want to thank Osman Usta for welcoming me into his home, despite my lack of Turkish at the time, and teaching me his expertise. I would also like to thank my mentors and colleagues at Village Ikshay Abidal University, Murat Tashteki, and Denise Sari for mentoring me, Hussein for helping me photograph and measure the ceramics, and my friends Hadi and Sivangril. Additionally, I would like to thank the 2014 Cinema Hurriac Excavation Crew, namely Nijat and Zainab Bilgin, and my often co-author, Krypton Donor. Thank you, Noreen, for teaching me morphometrics. Finally, I would like to thank the two groups who have funded me, the Turkish Fulbright Commission and the Graduate Student Association at the University of Buffalo. Without the funding, I wouldn't have been able to travel to Turkey and complete this research.